Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for coming to this lunchtime talk today, which is part of our Center for Internet and Society speaker series. And we are fortunate to have with us here today my friend Neil Richards, who is a professor of law at Washington University School of Law. Um, he has won awards for his teaching. He's written many fascinating and interesting to read articles about privacy and explaining why privacy is important. Um, and he has uh, clerked for Justice Rehnquist. He teaches privacy law in addition to many other things. I see some of the um, people who are in my privacy law class here, and we may have some questions for you about the study of privacy law as well. Um, but what Neil's going to do today is he's going to talk to us about his new book on intellectual privacy. So thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, Virginia. That, that, that guy sounds great. Um, I don't know who he is. <laughs> Um, so th th thank you all for coming. You, you never quite know uh, when, you, when you give a talk how many people will be here. I'm, I'm, I'm gratified so many of you have come um, for the food and also to hear me uh, talk about my, my book. Um, so I, I want to talk to you about one big idea today, uh, which I call intellectual privacy. But, but first, um, does anybody know what one of these is? Um, th this is, th this, as I explained to my children recently, this is a typewriter. Um, and I, I'm 42 years old. Has, has anybody here never used a typewriter? Fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm giving a talk, I'm, I'm talking about the book tomorrow night to, uh, to a room of 400 Washington University alumni, um, most of whom are going to be sort of over 50. And uh, I, 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 I like to be able to report that, you know, when I talk about typewriters, that there are people who've never used them. So I'm, I'm not over 50, I'm 42 years old, um, and I am just old enough that I can remember having used one of these things for school. So um, in eighth grade, uh, I had, was assigned to write a term paper um, on the island of Grenada, um, which had recently been invaded by, by your government. Um, and I remember having to use one of these things. And, and the worst thing about a typewriter um, is if you make a, well, is you have to retype every draft. Um, and if you have to make a mistake, you, there's this stuff called liquid paper, which is essentially expensive white paint that you would paint over the, the type, think of all the typos you use. There's no autocorrect. <laughs> you'd, you'd type over the, the ink, and then you have to wait for it to dry. You'd get like a gummy mess when it was in there. And it was, it was, so I'm just old enough to have used this stuff, but young enough that I was completely frustrated by it. So I remember cajoling my parents um, into buying for my computer, um, and this was the computer I was using in, in the mid-1980s, a Commodore 64 with 64 kilobytes of RAM, um, which is less memory than the image that this picture, substantially less memory than the size of this JPEG um, that you're viewing today. I, I asked them to, to, to buy me for my birthday, because I was a, a dork in many ways, um, the word processor, the killer app for the Commodore 64 Bank Street Run. Now, it came, this was the disk that it came on. Um, the disk was not quite that big, but it was almost that big. It was a five inch square disk. This is what the, it, this was not, my, this is actually pirated. Um, this was not my version. We, we, we went to the store and we paid money and bought the box back. Um, but this is the only image of the load screen that I could find. And this is what you would use. Um, you, would, you would enter your text here and when you were, you were finished, you could save it to the disk, to a different disk, and if you were lucky, the disk would remember the, the data, um, and so therefore you'd be able to not retype everything. Um, and for me, this was, I, I like technology, this was a, this was a wonderful uh, convenience, um, but something fundamental happened in the switch, not for me, but for all of us, in the switch from typewriters to word processes, from, from paper to pixels. In our lifetimes, the technologies we have used to communicate, to write, to explore the world have moved from their paper equivalents, the, the, the letter, um, the newspaper, and the book, um, and they've switched into digital versions, the email, the web page, and, and the ebook. And this is a fundamental change because these technologies uh, yes, they, they're, they are amazing. They allow us to, to communicate the increase of productivity. Um, they allow us to reach out to the world, to learn more about the world. Um, but they are also, unlike paper, engineered by design to create records of their use. And that is something new. 
Um, we, we tend to think about these technologies, letters, emails, uh, newspapers, as implicating the freedom of speech. And communications technologies do. And, and communications practices, of course, implicate freedom of speech. Um, but they also implicate privacy. Right? The privacy meaning the rules that govern the data, the information about us, about our reading, about our speech. Um, in 1993, the New Yorker ran this famous and, and if you're of a certain generation, totally overplayed and boring cartoon um, that said on the internet, nobody knows you're talking. And, and professors were making, I, I've never used this slide before talking about this book. Professors were, were uh, Jennifer will know, really, really bad jokes. Oh, on the internet, no one knows you're talking. It was, it was so annoying. But the, the truth, the fundamental truth of this, why this was funny in 1993, was the 1993 internet was not engineered for detection. It was by design under TCP IP and under the web, an anonymous internet. We don't have that anymore. The New Yorker ran this cartoon a couple of months ago. It has the same dogs. Um, they're slightly longer in the tooth. They've got more gray hairs. Um, and and, they're, and the, the, the guy, he's bald too. Um, the, the, they, remember on the internet, no one knew who you were. Right? We have moved from an internet that was anonymous to an internet that is tracked, that is surveilled, that is monitored both by the government and by, by private actors, and also by the government in partnership or in, in, uh, co by, under contract with or in connivance with, with private actors. So my story is a story about technology, but more importantly, it's a story about the human values that should undergird that technology. Um, that we want to build an internet, not just for dogs, but for humans that preserve the values, the values of freedom of speech and the values of privacy that we have spent decades and centuries figuring out that we care about them, um, and other values as well. So there's two ideas in the book. I want to spend less time on the first idea uh, so I can make room for questions and more time on the second idea. But the basic idea is when we have a conflict between freedom of speech and privacy, freedom of speech should usually win. So I, I'm thinking here um, about uh, the traditional rights to privacy, uh, media disclosures about celebrity sex lives, what have you. Um, but the second idea, and that's the one that I really want to focus on with us this afternoon, um, is that free speech requires something that I like to call intellectual privacy. So, so, so what you might ask, or I hope you're asking, what is intellectual privacy? Intellectual privacy is the protection from being watched or being interfered with when we're engaged in the process of generating ideas, when we are thinking, when we are reading, and when we are speaking with our confidence. So it's, it's when we're surfing the web, it's when we're sending emails, it's when we are uh, entering our queries, our wonderings, our musings, our fantasies into Google or Siri um, and, and receiving answers uh, or suggested answers to our, to our questions. Let me talk briefly about the first idea. The first idea um, in American law dates back to the famous article by Lewis Brandeis and Samuel Warren, The Right to Privacy, for Harvard Law Review 193. Right? This is the most cited, actually it, for like 100 years, it was, it's the second most cited article in the history of, of the law reviews. Um, the, the claim of the article is that the common law should recognize a right to privacy, to protect us, protect our personalities from embarrassment when private, embarrassing facts are produced. Um, it actually came out of a request by, by Warren's wife, uh, Mabel Warren, to protect the secrecy of their totally extravagant Boston Brahmin dinner parties um, from the prying democratic press of newspaper, you know, radical sort of uh, lowbrow newspapers like the Boston Globe, the New York Times, and the Washington Post, uh, which were this, this, this wave of uh, so-called yellow journalists in, in, in the 1890s. Um, you can, one can talk a lot about this kind of privacy, um, but a big problem with it is we often talk about politicians, about celebrities, about their lives, um, to figure out what we value. Um, and I think in almost all cases, when we have a conflict between a free press and this kind of privacy, 
the free press should also win. The, the, the one qualification, it's an important one I would make, would be so-called non-consensual pornography or revenge porn. That's a separate issue I talk about it in the book. I'm happy to talk about it in, in the Q&A. But I want to move on because I want to spend our time focusing on, on intellectual privacy. So, so what does it mean to protect ourselves um, when we are, we, we are thinking about the world? Um, we have a system, a legal system, uh, with a very strong First Amendment um, that cares about expression and intellectual innovation and dissent um, and eccentricity and weirdness. We have and save your family the trouble. In other words, the power that this activity gave to the watcher um, was used for, uh, in, in this case, to silence perhaps the most important social critic U.S. history has produced, certainly the, the, the most important one for the last 150 years. So let me talk about three uh, special dimensions of intellectual privacy and then talk about uh, what I think we should do to, to work on this problem. So the first has to do with, with thinking and, and the freedom of thought right, being one of the fundamental uh, civil liberties that, that we have. Justice Cardozo called it the, the indispensable condition of, of liberty. So, so what is this, is this girl thinking? Um, can we tell? Um, well, no, but we, we could ask her. Um, we asked my son, um, and he actually drew us this map. He came, he came, from, the, he came from the playroom. Uh, uh, he actually did it entirely on his own. We didn't, this, this wasn't like, I need a slide for my talk, so could you like do this? He actually he produced this. Um, and he, he mapped his brain, and you, you see there's soccer and reading and Star Wars and football. Um, he, doesn't, he really doesn't sleep very much. This is, this is accurate. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of awesomeness um, and, and quite a bit of screaming and a little bit of stupidness. And, of course, play. Um, we can't do this for people, but Google's pretty close. Think about all of the things you have entered in your life uh, into the search bar on Google or whatever, whatever search engine you you use, right? Hold, hold it in your head. Um, everything you've typed in, um, everything you've wondered about, every kind of picture you've tried to look at, every kind of uh, piece of information. Um, Google and other digital technologies have become adjuncts to our cognition, right? They've been, they, they've become uh, adjuncts to the way, the way that we think. Um, but they also create something pretty close to a partial transcript of the wonderings and the wanderings of the human mind. Uh, Google itself has recognized this, uh, not on, on uh, the, bra the search engine in this case, but on the browser. When they launched the Chrome browser, right, the, the slogan was browse the web as fast as you think. Web browsers, and particularly search engines, are adjuncts to our thinking. They create these records, and these records are special. Um, but currently, our law doesn't give them special protection. Let me talk second about reading. Um, reading is a fundamental, uh, that was the old slogan from the 80s, right? Uh, reading is fundamental. But, uh, but reading is a fundamental uh, part of a, of a free society, the right to read freely uh, in an unmonitored way and without, without constraint. What is this woman reading? Well, if she was an English woman about three or four years ago, um, and she's reading on her Kindle, she was probably reading these books. Um, the, the story of the publication of Fifty Shades of Grey is a story of privacy. It is a story of the privacy afforded by Kindles. Um, they spread on Kindles because, as E.L. James's publicist put it, um, women writing the tube, um, no one knows what they're reading on their Kindles. Right? They could be sitting there across from you in the London Underground, um, if they're carrying a 500-page uh, a heavy black book of, of badly written s and fantasy, um, you're going to see that. Um, but this, of course, though, is before the publishing sensation, right? This publishing sensation was possible because word of mouth and Kindles and Nooks and Kobos and other e-readers allowed people to read these books. The problem is the way a Kindle is engineered. Right? The Kindle is engineered, of course, that it has to know, or that there has to be a data record of, of what books you own and what books you have on your device. 
But Amazon, being a data company, uh, goes further, and they engineer the Kindle to know what page you are on, um, how much of the book you've read, how much of the books you buy you actually read, rather than just sort of say you've bought them, um, what passages, how long it takes you to read, what passages you've read, or maybe reread, or maybe reread and reread and reread in a book like this, right? That Amazon knows that, and currently, there is no special protection for, for reading under federal law. There are some exceptions, like California has a, has a good statute. Um, we do have protection, though, for video rental records. So in the 1980s, uh, Robert Bork, who was a conservative nominee to the Supreme Court, made the claim in the abortion context he didn't believe in the rights of privacy. So Michael Dolan, who was an enterprising uh, reporter for the Washington City Paper, the alternative weekly in D.C., went to Potomac Video, where he and Bork, by coincidence, rented their movie. So I should also say, th these were these buildings where you would go and you would, you would uh, have an account and they would lend you these, these plastic boxes um, and you would put them into a device under your computer and you could watch movies. Um, and then you had to rewind them. And, you would, take, and then you, would, you would not take them back on time and they would fine you. But this was, this was how you watched movies in the 1980s. He, he, got, he went to the clerk and he said, that Bork's a jerk, isn't it? Goes, Absolutely. Um, and then he said, well, could you give me his rental records? And the clerk said, of course, I'd be happy to do that. And so he handed over to Dolan um, everything that Bob Bork had watched. Now, now, I know how you want this story to end, but right? it turns out um, that, that Bork is into...
um, sort of uh, German bisexual S&M. But it turns out he wasn't. The, the most exotic thing he rented um, was John Carpenter, John Hughes's, not John Carpenter, there were some John Carpenter movies on there, but John Hughes's 16 Candles. Um, but we believe that was rented by Bork's 16-year-old daughter, so that doesn't really count. Um, but the article ended uh, with an, in the city paper with the om ominous statement, this could really be a life's work. I could just imagine other people in Washington, what are they renting from Blockbuster and Potomac Video and Family Video? Um, in blinding speed, I think it's like three weeks, Congress passed a federal law protecting <laughs> the confidentiality of video rental records, right? So we have this federal law, and it actually still is on the books. It was actually drafted really well um, because it was drafted in a way it actually uh, covered uh, VHS and beta too, um, but also DVDs and Blu-rays, and has because it regulated the cultural practice, which is absolutely the way you want to regulate in the tech sector. Not you don't regulate a technology, you regulate a social practice. Um, it actually has been held to apply to Netflix queues and Netflix data as well. Um, very successful law, but spotty in protection. Right, we have protection for movie watching under federal law, but no protection for for reading, which is which is anomalous. So, I have to mention my, my other child. Um, my, my daughter Fiona is, turns 12 next week. Um, and, and so in sort of academic households, right, this, it's, really, it's like living in law school, which is d deeply disturbing as a child. Um, but we, we talk about things at the dinner table. And one of the things we, we talked about once, she asked what my book that I was working on, the thing that's keeping me up, up in the office so much, what's it about? I said, well, it's about the, the privacy of, of reading, among other things. It's, it's so uh, people should have the right to read what they want freely. And she, I said, and she was only about 10 at the time. And she said, I think that's wonderful. It's, it, I think we should totally have that right. She's very opinionated. Um, we should have that right so me and Declan, that's her brother with the, with the brain map, um, so me and Declan can read inappropriate books. And I think that is, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, I, I, I could not have thought it better myself, and, and I'm giving her credit because I don't want to plagiarize my own daughter, but this idea of inappropriate books captures exactly what it means to have a free mind in a free society. Right? It, it means there's no such thing as inappropriate books, unless you're my children, in which case, you know. But eventually, even they will be able to read inappropriate books. Right? Adults should be able to read freely, whether it is the writings of Ayman al-Zawahiri, if such things exist, whether it is Mein Kampf, whether it is, though I don't know why you would want to, Fifty Shades of Grey, um, whether it's the, the Federalist Papers or, or uh, uh, Kim Kardashian's autobiography, right? The, the, we in a free society should get to read what we want, and we shouldn't have the tyranny of the social publicizing everything we are reading or creating the potential of publicizing everything we are reading, um, because that would turn our marketplace of ideas into something akin to a middle school cafeteria, um, in which everyone knows everyone, everything about everyone, and there is much less room. There's a stifling conformity and much less room for intellectual um, diversity. Uh, and before we so leave this point, it's worth noticing, noting that, that most of the ideas that we take for granted uh, the equality of the sexes and the races, um, the equality of all people based upon sexual orientation, the idea that the people should control the government and the government should control the people, the idea that we should have separation of church and state and not live in a theocracy. Most of the ideas that we care really deeply about were ideas that were once more than inappropriate. They were subversive and people have died for all of these ideas. And I suspect there is something we are doing now. I don't know what it is. I've got my suggestions. We all have our suggestions. There's something we're doing now that future generations will look back and say, could you believe that they did that and no one would speak out? And I'm concerned that this, this tyranny of the, of, of the social um, will stifle, particularly in a digital environment, will stifle us from really engaging with potentially radical, potentially destabilizing ideas. So, so let's say you've, you've done your thinking um, and you've done some reading about the things you might be interested in. To develop an idea before it is ready to, to spread to the world requires you to sometimes to test it out with, with people you care about, whether it's your, your partner or your friend or your lawyer um, or, your, or your colleagues. Uh, you confide in others. This is Roy Olmsted. 
Um, if you've taken criminal procedure, you'll know the case of Olmstead versus United States, in which the Supreme Court considered whether uh, the Fourth Amendment protected telephone calls and rejected it. Um, Olmstead was a former Seattle police officer who was a bootlegger uh, in the 1920s. He was the largest employer in the Puget Sound area. Um, and he made a lot of money selling whiskey and beer uh, to people in Seattle and, and elsewhere. Uh, the police sort of knew that Olmstead was a bootlegger. So what they did is they wiretapped his phone line. They didn't go into his house. They just tapped his phones. And they found out, the, they found the evidence they needed to convict him. He was convicted. He appealed his conviction to the Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court upheld his conviction on the ground that because there was no physical trespass, because the Fourth Amendment protects uh, a person's houses, persons, papers, and effects, physical things, um, the movement of electrons in the ether along a line, which he didn't own, was not protected by the Fourth Amendment. Justice Brandeis dissented, adapting his argument from his 1890 article, uh, which he'd written, incidentally, 38 years before. Um, so he only talked about privacy twice in his life, once when he was a young man of 30. Um, it's actually, it's, it's to, to, as, a, as a professional academic, it's just deeply depressing that a 30-year-old Justice Brandeis could have written that article. Um, but as, when he was 68, in, in uh, the Olmsted case, he dissented, um, and he argued that when it comes to privacy against the government rather than privacy against the press, we have to have these protections, particularly as times change and technologies advance. Um, he, he wrote quite prophetically, uh, if we don't protect phone calls, ways may one day be developed where the government uh, may, through advances in the psychic sciences, um, be able to discover the contents of a piece of paper locked in someone's dresser and reproduce in their filing cabinet and reproduce them in court. Right? He actually he's thinking about the cloud in 1928, and he's saying we need to protect the cloud when it comes to to privacy. Unfortunately, there's this rather and Jennifer and I were talking about this at lunch. There's this absurd reading of the Fourth Amendment called the Third Party Doctrine, um, which arguably, um, as you can tell, I, I think it's unpersuasive. But a lot of people do believe, do find it persuasive that email is not protected. So, so, we, so letters and, and telephone calls, Supreme Court ultimately reversed itself in the Katz case and protected phone calls. But there's a, this interpretation that emails are not protected by the Fourth Amendment. Um, does anybody know who this is? Do you know who this is? Who, who is it? Uh, Warshak? It's not Warshak. It's, 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 it's Smiling Bob. Right, so, so you may remember um, about 10, 15 years ago, there was this series of commercials for Enzite, the natural male enhancer. Um, and there was music playing in the background. And, and this, was, this was the character who was shilling for Enzite, Smiling Bob, who would walk around um, with a huge smile on his face because presumably he'd been taking Enzite and had massive erections and, and could, uh, it, was, it was improving his quality of life, let's say. Um, <laughs> so it turns out, shockingly, so don't, don't go out and buy Enzite. Um, you can't actually anymore because the company's out of business. Um, it was all a fraud. It was one of these sort of herbal snake oil things. The real business wasn't uh, the, the company, great name, Berkeley Nutraceuticals, um, run by Mr. Warshak and his mother, sort of a, a, a charming mother-son business operation um, for fraudulent male enhancement pills. Uh, they were actually, when you signed up for, for Enzyte, so I am told, you would get a, uh, you, they, you would sign up for a, for a service where they would just keep shipping you the Enzite. Uh, you, you didn't buy a box of pills, you bought a subscription to an open-ended subscription. Um, and, and shockingly, if you, try, if you decided, this Enzite actually isn't working, my life is not as good as Smiling Bob's, um, I want my refund, or at least I want to have no more pills, they wouldn't uh, cancel, right? And so the money was actually in this, this, this time gap um, between when you ordered and when you, that you finally persuaded them to to shut it down. Um, they had a number of complaints with the credit card companies. They lost lines of credit. And in order to get new lines of credit on which the business depended, they made fraudulent statements in order to uh, get more lines of credit. Uh, they were investigated by, by the police. The police obtained, using uh, the, the ECPA, the Store Communications Act, they obtained thousands of emails from Nuvox, their ISP. Um, and Warshak and Mrs. Warshak were convicted. Now, they argued that the 
police violated the Fourth Amendment because they did not get a warrant before they obtained the emails. They only got a lower sort of administrative subpoena or a court order to get them as required by the Stored Communications Act. And the, Supreme, and, and the Court of Appeals, not the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals held that emails culturally are like phone calls and they are like letters. They are an important dimension of communications privacy. They are important, they didn't get into intellectual privacy, but it was, this theory certainly consistent with the intuition the court had, even though that it couldn't quite articulate it in these terms. Um, and it protected the Fourth Amendment right of all of us to have our emails held secure against the government without them getting a warrant. And then in a, in a, in a bizarre twist, it said, but the police couldn't have known that. So we call this, in this particular case, it's harmless error, um, and the Warshaks go to prison. But now all, everybody else um, gets Fourth Amendment protection for their emails. So, so thank you, Mr. Warshak, for protecting our civil liberties. Have fun in prison. OK, so the Supreme Court has not ruled on emails yet. Uh, it is an open question. But in a couple of recent cases, the Jones case, and, and particularly the Riley case from last term, the, the court has suggested it wants to, to look at the Fourth Amendment in an evolving, technologically sophisticated way, um, rather than in a, a, a wooden, cramped, originalist, Justice Scalia kind of way. Um, and it, the court in Riley held that in a search incident to arrest, the police must get a second warrant in order to search the contents of a person's mobile phone, smartphone recognizing, right, using the term diary, um, that our digital devices, our digital accounts, our digital technologies are adjuncts to our thinking, adjuncts to our lives, adjuncts um, to our development of ideas, um, and worthy of special treatment. So the Supreme Court is leaning in this direction, but it hasn't actually held this. OK, so, so let's say you agree with me, um, and a couple of people have nodded their heads at various points, that this is something we should protect. What, what should we do? Well, we need to think beyond tort privacy, right? The idea that uh, people, cele this is Ryan Giggs who played for Manchester United who got a super injunction against the English press um, for disclosing revelations about his sex life. Um, that privacy is more than hiding embarrassing facts about ourselves from the media. We need to, to get past that. And we need to think about protecting intellectual privacy through law, things like a federal uh, uh, reader data act, data act, the way we have a federal video privacy protection act. Uh, we need to recognize that intellectual privacy is not just for intellectuals. Right? You might think that these are not my children. These are, these are Woody Hartzog's children. Um, that uh, Woody got a copy of Intellectual Privacy for his birthday, and they were my nerd friends and their nerd children. Um, they were very excited. Um, you might think that intellectual privacy is just for pointy-headed academics sitting in their ivory towers stroking their goatees. Right? Obviously, I don't have a goatee, I, and I don't have a pointy head. It's, it's melon-shaped. Um, but intellectual privacy is for anybody with an intellect, right? The way intellectual property is not just for intellectuals. Intellectual freedom is not just for intellectuals. Intellectual privacy is, is for everyone. We also need to recognize that intellectual records are sensitive records uh, within the, the nomenclature of privacy law. They're, they're records that data, um, inferences that are worthy of special protection beyond the very thin notice and choice regime that most privacy uh, uh, law provides for personal data. We also need to reject the idea that privacy is binary. Um, obviously, digital, digital data is itself binary. But binary in the sense that privacy is on or off, private or public, known only to me in my heart of hearts, um, or, sh or as Warren Brown has put it, shouted across the rooftops to the entire world. Most information is, and always has been, and always will be, even in a digital age, somewhere between those two extremes. And our challenge as lawyers and as citizens is to figure out rules, whether by law or social norms um, or other kinds of uh, mechanisms, to govern that information. Right? But the fact that information is shared with somebody else isn't the end of the privacy analysis. It's the beginning. In particular, we need to think about the concept of confidentiality, right? a concept that is particularly important to lawyers. For lawyers, client confidences aren't binary. The client tells us their secrets. Sometimes they're embarrassing or liability-producing secrets, so we can give them good advice. A doctor, we tell them um, about the funny rash we have on our butt or, or whatever it is. 
no matter how embarrassing, so they can treat us. And what's interesting is in these sorts of relationships, everybody wins. Information is shared, more information is shared, uh, more sensitive information is shared, but the promise of confidentiality and the trust that that promise brings allows the client to receive better legal advice, it allows the doctor to treat the patient, and it allows both the doctor and the lawyer to do their jobs and to make money. And everybody is better off because there's a restriction on the flow of information. Lawyers and doctors don't think about uh, client data as a business asset that could be sold off in bankruptcy, um, right? That the way a lot of technology companies tend to think about such things. And we need to extend judiciously the concept of confidentiality into the digital sphere. Now, we also need to think beyond law. It might be odd for a law professor to be standing up and saying this to you. Um, but I think it's, it's important to realize this is a, that law has its limits as a tool. And there are certain things that law cannot do. Law has an important role to play in the protection of intellectual privacy, but it's not essential. Uh, sorry, it, 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 it's, it shouldn't be exclusive. It is essential. It shouldn't be exclusive. We need to develop a professional ethics of technologists and of engineers, uh, including pr intellectual privacy, but more generally. When lawyers and doctors in our history achieved social power to change the, the world or people in it, right? lawyers can change a person's social standing within the system of rules. Doctors can change a person's health. Um, they developed a professional ethics governing rules, professional rules, to harness and nurture their social power for the good of society and for the good of the profession. And technologists have reached a similar point in our society, and they need to talk about ethics. Sometimes they do, right, that Google's oft quoted, oft misquoted mantra, don't be evil, is the beginnings of a technological professional ethics. There's older antecedents in sort of uh, principles of hacker ethics and, and other areas. But in terms of a professionalization of those ethics, don't be evil is a start, but it is only a start. And we've just seen it's not complete. In, in developing this ethics, I, I think technologists could look to librarians um, who were the original information professionals, um, custodians of intellectual data, of, of intellectual wanderings, reference librarians, um, who you say, I need information on chlamydia or communism um, or, uh, or sexuality. You have to tell them the information so they can help you. And librarians committed themselves, um, I've deleted that slide, librarians committed themselves to a uh, library code of conduct protecting freedom of inquiry, freedom of access, and patron privacy and confidentiality in order to help those patrons. So in developing an information ethics, there are a number of developments we, we, we've already seen. We're starting to see businesses compete on intellectual privacy. Um, of course, there are the famous Mozilla privacy principles, um, limited data collection, weird as that may sound, given the big data rhetoric that we are bombarded by every day. Um, putting users in control, giving them real choices, making sure there are no surprises. Um, you, I'm sure you know about DuckDuckGo, the uh, alternative to Google um, as a search engine that operates on something other than finely grained individual surveillance um, and actually works rather well. In addition, I think it's important for technology companies um, not to always take the Steve Jobs approach of, I've invented something awesome. I just now need to persuade people that it's what they need. Now, it did turn out that, a, that an iPod uh, that, that also was a telephone was a really good idea. Um, that was good. Um, but the way, and it's not that innovation is bad, but it's the way it is sold, right? So, so the, the example here, right, if you tell someone we want to invade your privacy, that's bad. But if we want to make it awesome and, and have an MP3 player attached, um, and we're just bundling in, the, the privacy invasion as part of the service, um, I think is, is ultimately dishonest. And, and I think we need to, as consumers, um, see through some of these, some of these ruses and demand uh, intellectual privacy for ourselves. So one of my favorite authors, the Anglo-American novelist Zadie Smith, put it really well in her review of uh, Jaron Lanier's book, You're Not a Gadget, and the, the movie The Social Network in the New York Review of Books a few years ago. 
Uh, Smith said, in the Anglo-American world, we race ahead with technology, and we hope the ideas will look after themselves. And I think my book is an attempt to introduce one of these ideas into our technologies, into our social practices, um, before the social practices themselves normalize and it becomes too late. And I think that as we develop new technologies and as we develop uh, social practices and laws to regulate those technologies, one of the values we should be sure we are building into our digital society um, is a heaping helping of intellectual privacy. Have, we have some time for questions, so if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand and I'll come to you with a microphone. But as the um, person with the microphone, I'm going to take the uh, first question prerogative. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that I think is so exciting about this talk and your book is, you know, in our privacy class, we're talking about this. So much of privacy doctrine and theory is actually being developed right now unlike many of other areas of law where the doctrines were developed long ago and we're sort of studying them or tweaking them, there's so much important stuff going on now by um, scholars who are actually practicing now like you. So thanks for coming and talking about the book. Um, I think one of the problems that we face is the idea that when we're making choices, either as consumers or as technologists or whatever, we, we don't know what to worry about, and we have sort of a short-term gain versus long-term problem, and I think that's a problem here. So what's your reaction to the common response to these kinds of, these ideas that there should be controls, that we are going to miss out on things like, for example, innovation? Don't you, I want to know that if I've read these three books, I'll probably like this fourth book. Or I think in the area that we're starting to see intellectual property maybe become most under pressure with students and student learning now that we have more like homework on devices and tests on computers. Huh? Oh, sorry, student privacy. Yeah, it, where you know they, you can tell how long it takes people to do a test, and how did they figure it out, and how many era- answers did they erase, and you know that information can be very useful for diagnosing learning disabilities or for um, cheating or you know those sorts of things. How do we, you know, as, as a society, how do we notice the problems or what the trade-offs are, and then how do we start to approach figuring them out? Yeah, so so that's a great a great point. Um, some of the things that I'm calling for um, are really hard. Um, and, and ultimately, I'll consider this project to be successful if we merely bring intellectual privacy into the balance. Right? That, that these are, there are important trade-offs here. But in the, so there's, there's, there's two examples here. Right? One is uh, the recommendation engine of, say, Amazon, um, which is great. Right? That uh, The idea that whether it's Amazon, or whether it's uh, Pandora or Spotify or um, Netflix, the idea that we can use data, we can use algorithms to apply data learned from past instances to make predictions about future behavior, in this case, intellectual behavior. I think that's incredibly valuable. I mean, I think um, the, and it's just like the reference librarian. Um, so when that data is being used, to enhance the, the intellectual or the entertainment experience, um, if it is being used as the businesses tout it for your benefit to make things more awesome, as my children would say, I think that's good. Um, but I think the fact that the information is collected for that purpose doesn't necessarily then mean it can be used for any other purpose. And I think it's important at that point to draw a line and say, OK, so Amazon or Spotify or Pandora or Netflix you have the data and you've used it to help the customer, and they've also, incidentally, bought more crap from you. Um, so that's good for you. But to then say that that data flows into an undifferentiated stream of, of business assets, I think we should at least have the conversation about whether we want, that we want to then draw a line. Um, because the conversation we're going to be having about data generally is what lines do we draw and on what basis do we draw the lines. And we're going to need to draw some lines, if only for you know, the prevention of, of security data breaches and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to need to come up with norms and rules to govern the flows of data. And I think intellectual privacy, in the case of entertainment, is, is one place we can do it. In the education context, I, I agree with you in, in entirely. I think it can be, it can be quite useful um, to have this data. It's interesting, too, when we talk about children, we're much more willing uh, as a society, even in 
um, the sort of Randian influenced tech sector to say, well, children are different because they're not fully autonomous humans and not rational. Um, I think actually we're all a lot more like the children we want to protect when we're using devices than we like to admit. But putting that to one side for a moment, when we're using things in, in the context of technology, it absolutely is, is useful. I would say two qualifications. Um, one, we do want children to grow up into adults um, who have values of, of things like intellectual freedom. And, and so we don't want to necessarily, we want to allow children to develop in ways, as we're trying to do with our kids, uh, where they do get some autonomy and they do get some privacy as they are ready for it. And I think uh, sort of helicopter parenting, always on digital surveillance of children all the time, is horrifying and it will produce a, a very, very bad result for us. I would say the other, the other qualification um, is we do want to be careful in education that we don't make everything about data, right? I, mean, I think we've seen in the case of, of testing uh, and the obsession with testing and the obsession with measurement, that that's not always the best way to, to educate children. And the solution to ineffective testing and measurement, I don't think is, though it is politically easy, more data and more testing and more measurement. So I think it's important also not to fetishize the technologies and ultimately to look at them as what they are, human created tools um, that are built by humans to serve human purposes and should be embodied with, with human values. And, and intellectual privacy isn't the only one. Um, equality, economic opportunity, uh, you know, other, other values are important, but this is the one that I've, I've chosen to spend the last few years thinking about. You're talking about technology that uh, goes way beyond the U.S. borders, and you yourself are from Europe. Can you reflect on uh, attitudes toward these things outside the United States and how they're different from here? So, so that my book makes two claims, right? One, when free speech and privacy conflict, free speech should always win. And second, we should care a lot about intellectual privacy. When I go to Europe, um, I am castigated for being far too free speech. Um, and, but they generally agree with the intellectual privacy argument. Uh, I think the, the attitudes towards uh, data and privacy in Europe are much more complex. I, I think U Europeans care more about uh, individual privacy. You know, it varies across countries, and it varies on what kind of data we're talking about. Um, but I think, in general, um, Europeans are uh, much more ready to regulate on this, on this basis and on other bases, um, I, I think it's, it's going to create a problem that we need to have, a, because the data does flow internationally, we're going to need to have a system of globally interoperable privacy rules. Another reason we need to have rules um, so that data can flow, and it's, it's essential um, to, to economic prosperity that it does. Um, but the Europeans in general are much more ready uh, to censor the press uh, because uh, celebrity affairs are, are being publicized, uh, Europeans are also much readier to, to regulate technology companies. Um, and interestingly, we're actually seeing with things like the Google Spain case um, and, and the Gore Vidal, not the Gore Vidal, the Vidal Hall case against Google it was decided in Britain a couple of weeks ago. Um, because the technologies have to be written, the code has to be written in a way that is, is more efficient to work, um, regulatory effects in Europe um, are, are, and liability imposed in Europe is starting to affect how the business practices are developed here and how the data and the interfaces for the data and the storage settings for the data um, are rolled out to Americans. So it's, it's, you're exactly right. So sort of implicit in your question, we can't just talk about American rules here because even though the US is the most important player in the digital economy, um, other jurisdictions are, are increasingly important and are increasingly demanding um, you know, other sorts of protections and rules apply, including intellectual privacy. That, uh, uh, I, I don't want to sound like Hasselhoff, but it, this is bigger in Germany. Um. Hi. Um, I'm surprised you didn't mention the Internet of Things at all in your talk, uh, because there's been a lot of things written in privacy about how there's soon going to be, you know, many billions of devices constantly monitoring us in all sorts of ways. Uh, so. How do you see that influencing your, your argument here? That's a great point. So I, I didn't mention the Internet of Things because I wanted to leave, 
leave time for questions, but the IoT is, is a tremendously important development, sort of the next phase of the networking of society to put sensors and network chips and, and data recorders in everything. Uh, maybe not bottles of water, but maybe bottles so I can, I can measure my uh, liquid consumption over, over the course of the day. Um, in, in my privacy law course, we talked about two of these things recently. One is the Samsung Smart TV um, that is voice activated and can is needs to record data uh, in your living room in order to um, uh, upload it to the cloud to recognize it and improve the speech recognition algorithms. Um, incidentally, right, the, the Connect has been doing this for, for a long time, but Microsoft keeps the data on the device rather than automatically cloud uplinking it, which is a good design choice as protective intellectual privacy. Second is Hello Barbie, uh, which is this, uh, it's Barbie plus the internet. So this idea, right, uh, and, and living where you do, you must hear it, X plus internet equals awesomer. Um, and so in this case, X equals Barbie. So Barbie plus internet equals awesomer. They've turned Barbie um, into a Wi-Fi enabled cloud uplink device, um, sort of like putting Siri in Barbie. And this is not the plot of uh, you know, Black Mirror or her, right? This is real. Um, your, your child, or, or you if you still play with Barbies, um, could talk to Barbie like she's a person, and then Barbie will say, I'm really sad and you really need to buy me the dream house or else I will have to die. Um, and there was this huge privacy uproar uh, that Barbie was talking, again, to children because we care about privacy for children much more than we care about it culturally for adults. Um, and and uh, Barbie was, w w was in trouble. Let me say two things. One, I think this only, because these technologies are new, it's all the more urgent that we build these protections into them now rather than bolting them in as a patch later on, right? The, the initial design choices of the internet infrastructure and TCP IP and other sorts of protocols have proven enormously resilient because they are foundational code. And I think the sooner you get uh, human values into the design spec, the better. As an aside, um, so I talked to my students about uh, Hello Barbie. And the, Hello Barbie's lawyer is one of our university alumni. And I had dinner with him um, at my dean's house on Saturday night, just by total coincidence. Um, and I, sa I said to, to Bob, um, you know, we've been having this discussion, we had this great discussion about Hello Barbie, and then at the end of dinner, uh, as people often do, I excused myself to go to the bathroom. And, and since I care about privacy, when I entered the bathroom, I turned the lock, um, and about 30 seconds later, having achieved the, the, the goal I had in going into the bathroom, um, I tried to leave, and, and the dean has, a very, has an old house that she's recently moved into, and the lock was stuck. Um, and I couldn't get out of the bathroom. And it, to make the long story short, uh, Hello Barbie's lawyer tried to break down the private bathroom door um, to, to free me from, from the confine. In the end, I managed to use my massive law professor strength and, uh, and turn the latch so we could open the door and get out. But, but the IoT is a tremendously important idea. But I also would, would say it's important not to fetishize the IoT too much, right? It's this sort of the, the next awesome wave of the internet. Um, we, we are going to be networking these things, but we do have a choice. And just because you know, X plus internet does not always equal awesome. And really, how we design these things and how we build them and whether we choose to do them or not actually has a lot more to do with, with, with whether we're building the kind of society we want to build um, or, rather than one that we don't. Um, I want to bring up the subject of oblivion, which was raised in France in, within the last year. And uh, I Sorry, guess... Which, which subject? Oblivion. Oblivion, yes. Uh, and, uh, by a, uh, and the French government was quite sympathetic to the thought that you not only had the right to privacy, but also <coughs> to not exist and be oblivious. Uh, in a sense. And so as you write about uh, privacy, uh, you, there is this competing uh, extreme of privacy. And I'm curious what you think about it. Taking also into account that the European nations collectively uh, put together what's now called the Budapest Convention, which uh, says how long ISPs must store the data of, on you, who you've written to, and the content thereof, in order that they can access it if they need 
in the name of a criminal prosecution for some period of time, which runs quite counter to oblivion. So, so the short answer is, it's complicated, but it's, it's a great question. So there's two things going on here. What, one is le droit à l'oubli, or the right to be forgotten, um, which it's often called, which was in the Google Gonzalez case. Under the old directive, it's going to be implemented most likely under the new European Data Protection Directive. But there's also these data retention rules, um, usually for government or national security purposes. Um, I would, I would say this since we're, we're I, I, we, I would have to talk about this for like two hours. It's, it's, a, it's a great and rich topic. But the point is, first of all, as I said, we're going to need to figure out what rules govern data. And the, and the death of data, or the, what uh, people in the industry call the information or data life cycle, is a tremendously important concept, right? How long do you keep data? How long is it useful for? At what point does data collected for one purpose um, get to be repurposed for another, or get to die, or be made to die, or deleted, or to be preserved for, for a permanent record. Um, I think the, um, the data retention uh, portion of this, so I think I've talked a little bit about ob Oblivia. I think the data retention is threatening to civil liberties. I, mean, I, I think it's, it's part of this an, a great irony of uh, of security services rhetoric, uh, privacy for us, but not for you. Uh, the idea that uh, entities like GCHQ or, or the NSA uh, want to pry into our lives and to have sort of unmonitored access, unfettered access to their monitoring, um, and to have the data preserved to make their jobs easier. At the same time, their very existence, if they would have their way, would be secrets, and in any event, their operations are shrouded in various levels of, uh, of legal and technical secrecy. I think these are the conversations we need to be having about the right balance for all of these things between privacy and, and transparency, between restriction and between access. And it, when it comes to the right to be forgotten, I think it's, it's one thing, and it's probably a very attractive thing to say that at some point data outlives its usefulness or becomes too risky to retain, whether it's through data breaches or incorrect uh, outputs and algorithms, and we should dispose of it. Um, on, on, on the other hand, uh, if we allowed people to treat the internet as their own personal Wikipedia and to delete anything about them that is unflattering uh, or unfavorable or embarrassing, I think we run into serious censorship concerns. So I, I think we have to navigate between those two uh, those two perilous areas. And, and ultimately, that's, that is being humans living in a society, is, is trying to have uh, the most of what we want um, while minimizing the dangers. And ultimately, I think and it's probably a good point as any to end on, um, the big challenge facing us all uh, in, these, in these areas is how to find and develop and seize the enormous benefits of these transformative digital technologies while minimizing as much as possible a lot of their dangers. And I, I think that, that my, my efforts in intellectual privacy are, are best understood along that direction. Um, but I think there are many other areas where we're going to have exactly the same value clash. And we have to, to make our way through to build the kind of digital society that, that we all want and makes us better, rather than the one that is most convenient or most efficient. Thank you, Neil. Thank you.